Books, books, I like books. I'm going to read them all. Hi readers, Chris here. Welcome to my channel where I review fantasy, Stephen King, all sorts of books. Today I'm going to be doing an episode of Fantasy and Face Masks. For fantasy, I'm going to be reviewing two books today, The Dream Thieves by Maggie Stifader and Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross. And our face mask today is going to be this charcoal uh, peel-off bubble mask by Lapcause. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I'm going to say Lapcause. Since I can't hold these books and put a face mask on at the same time, I'll just put a picture up for whatever book that I'm going to start with. And today I'm going to start with uh, The Dream Thieves. All right, The Dream Thieves. So The Dream Thieves is the second book in the Raven Cycle. So this started with the first book, which was called The Raven Boys. This is the second book. So just a quick setup about what this book is about. Um, in the first book, we had a group of friends, four boys known as the Raven Boys, because they go to this like fancy schmancy rich boy like school. And then our other main character is a young girl named Blue. Blue kind of runs across the Raven Boys and joins their crew. Now, Blue is special because she comes from a family of clairvoyants. So her mother has this ability to read tarot cards. Um, her mother's sister, so an aunt, she can also do like scrying and stuff. And then they have a friend who does psychic readings. But Blue herself is not psychic. Um, but she does have the power to like amplify others' psychic abilities. So long story short, this whole series is about... Blue and her group of friends uh, searching for a dead Welsh king who may or may not be buried in their town. They're trying to find him so that they can, well, I guess, <laughs> get a wish granted. And there's a lot more to it than that. It's like an oversimplification. But I want to jump in and talk about book two. Because in book one, I feel like you kind of got a full story and a full character arc for like every single character in the book. And there's a lot of them. But in book two, like even though there is still character development for our, like, all the characters, it really spends a lot of time focusing on one Raven boy in particular, this character Ronan. We met Ronan in book one. And when we met him, he had a raven sidekick that he nicknamed chainsaw like a pet and no one really knew where he come from where he came from the book didn't really go into much detail about where chainsaw came from but it definitely goes a lot more into detail in the second book so ronin is kind of the main character in book two we find out that ronin has a unique power and ability that was not explored in the first book and also in book two while they're while they are con continuing this search for this dead welsh king we also have a new villain that enters the uh, that enters the arena and all we're told about this guy is his name he's known as the gray man he's supposedly an assassin he's working for someone else a mysterious you know benefactor that we don't really know and he is trying to find something called a gray warren and again we don't know what a Grey Warren is. We just know that it has something to do with this dead Welsh king. And the Grey Man has been hired to find this Grey Warren on behalf of his benefactor. Okay, I think this is on good enough. So I'm just going to let this sit for uh, 10 to 20 minutes or so until it dries enough that I can peel it off. So like I said, because this book focuses on Ronan and this ability that we didn't know that he had, the beginning of this book is a bit jarring because it's like we take a character that we're very familiar with and all of a sudden he has this power, this huge magical power that was not explored in the first book. Like I think reflecting on it, I can see that there were hints to it, like his uh, random pet bird that came out of nowhere, but it was never explicitly stated what his power was. So the fact that this book just opens with like, hey, Ronan has this power, 
it is a little bit jarring. Um, but I was able to get over it because uh, the author does such a good job, both with the way that she develops these characters to the way that the plot flows to just the world that, you know, by the time I was halfway through, I was able to get past it and really, really, really enjoy this book. I really love the introduction of the Gray Man as well. It's really funny to me that this villain, he's very mysterious because he's just known as the Gray Man. And we don't really find out, you know, who he is until much later on in the book. And his journey and his story arc throughout the book is is very unique. It's very unique. And I can't talk about it without giving away spoilers, so it's hard. But let's just say that I think by the end of the book, like, he probably became a favorite character of mine because he just has a very unique story arc because he is a villain. He is very mysterious. And what ends up happening to him and the decisions that he makes make him really endearing by the end. Other than the Gray Man, all of my favorite characters were back. So all the rest of the uh, Raven Boys, you know, Gainsey, Adam, even Noah, they all still have, you know, their own stories and their own unique arcs, just like they did in the first book, which was really, really fun. And we even get to spend more time with Blue and explore more about her family, which again was also a delight. So long story short here, um, I thought this was a pretty good sequel. Other than the beginning, which I said was really jarring, you know, by the time I got to the end, I really ended up liking this book. It's a great sequel. It's got great characters. It has a really interesting plot. And the storyline just really expands in new and exciting ways that I was not expecting. I really had no idea where this story was going, and I was very surprised at some of the places that it went in this book, which was a refreshing delight. This is definitely one of those books that has like multiple plot lines going on at once. So there's the main plot line where like they're searching for this dead king, but like every character has a subplot line. Every character has their own unique, you know, either personal challenges that they're dealing with. Every character has, you know, um, a romance or like there's, there's so much going on in this story, and I think that's one of the things that makes it really fun to read because there are so many different things. Like, it just gives you a variety of stuff to really absorb and a variety of things to connect with. And even if you don't connect with, like, say, one particular storyline, you have so many others to choose from. I do feel like I've read a lot of I don't want to say bad, but I've read a lot of sequels recently that haven't been as good as the first. And while I don't think that Dream Thieves is as good as The Raven Boys, it was still a great sequel. It was still an enjoyable read and probably one of the better sequels that I have read recently. Okay, I don't know if you can tell, but this mask is starting to like bubble up and it feels really tingly on my skin. And a little bit itchy. I really want to scratch it, but um, I'm going to talk about the next book that I wanted to review today, which is Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross. Oh, that's really itchy on my nose. <laughs> okay, Dreams Lie Beneath. The setup of this book is that we have a young girl named Clementine, and Clementine and her father live in a small village at the base of a mountain. And in this world that they live in, they are basically living in a world that is cursed. So a long time ago, there was a kingdom up on the mountain, and it was ruled by this duke. But this group of, like, friends, advisors, basically, I don't know, they thought something bad about the duke, and they basically, like, pulled a mutiny on him, and they betrayed him, they stabbed him in the back, and they killed him. But because they did this, magically, the Duke was able to curse all of the land. So now, every, like, full moon, the land is infested with nightmares. Yes, people's nightmares actually come to life. They attack the towns, they attack the people, and they rely on magicians to defeat these nightmares and keep the people safe. 
So Clementine's father is one of these magicians. He is what is called a dream warden, and the dream warden protects his town from the nightmares. And Clementine is kind of like a dream warden in uh, in training. So her father's kind of getting old. He's getting a little, you know, ill, and she's basically in training to overtake his position. But in the very beginning of the book, like first chapter, these strangers come to town. Because apparently this is a rule that anyone that wants to become a dream warden has to challenge a current dream warden for their position. So they challenge them and basically they both go out and like fight the same nightmare and whoever wins gets to be the dream warden for that town. So what ends up happening, this is a tiny spoiler, but like it takes place in the first chapter. So if you don't want to know anything, like skip ahead like a minute. But I'm just going to say what ends up happening is that these strangers defeat Clementine and her father and they take over as the dream warden. So that means that Clementine and her family have to leave their town and have to go and start a new life somewhere else. So they move on to the city, and of course, Clementine is very bitter about what happened. Um, she's very unhappy about it. So she makes it her mission to, like, find these brothers, you know, find these brothers who made her lose her home, and find a way to, like, get back at them. So she is all about getting revenge. That is what she wants. She wants revenge on these brothers and on their family for defeating her father and taking away her home. And the way that she tries to go about this is really interesting because basically she tries to secretly like endear herself to one of the brothers. The brother, one brother is left behind as the dream warden and one brother is kind of living in town where Clementine is now. So she disguises herself, you know, tries to buddy up to him all the time, planning on, you know, secretly trying to find a way to bring him down. So that's a very like simple setup of the story, but what ends up happening is so much more than that, so much more. And this is what I really like about this story. It starts out as a very simple premise, a very simple like revenge tale, but it ends up expanding into this tale of like, you know, who you really are, who you really are on the inside, you know, what you really want in life. You know, there is this kind of, overarching uh, prophecy that maybe this curse can be broken somehow, but no one really knows how or why. And as Clementine starts to get deeper and deeper and starts to uncover secrets about this family, she starts to uncover secrets about her own family and secrets about herself. And it makes it really, really, really interesting read. Clementine as a character I found really interesting. You know, on one hand, there's nothing like super exciting about her. I think she does have a lot of the similar qualities that you would find in any other YA fantasy female protagonist. But at the same time, because she is motivated by a by revenge, which, you know, when you think about revenge is like not something that should motivate you when you really think about it, right? But because she is motivated by this revenge, I think it makes her a little bit interesting. It also makes her a little bit naive and careless at times. Um, but then on the other side, you know, even though she's motivated by something, you know, less than spectacular, she is still a good person on the inside, as most characters are. And I think the way in which... Um, the way in which she deals with, like, the morality of wanting revenge but also wanting to be a good person at the same time is an interesting internal struggle for her. And I think it's interesting to watch. Like, I think the book could have gone, like, deeper, but it is only a YA story, so you have to give it, like, a little bit of slack for that. The other thing I will mention is that this book is quite long. It is a 500 page book, which is long for a YA fantasy. And I do think that there were parts of the book that probably could have been edited down. 
Like, it, I don't think it needed to be that long. Um, but I did find myself, you know, really getting into the story and getting into the characters. So it didn't really bother me that much. It was easy for me to read. But I'll just put that out there if you're someone that doesn't like big chunky books. Um, there might be parts of this that are a little slow. And because there are parts that slow, I feel like the book leaves a lot of the big reveals till like the end. And I think like pacing wise and plot wise, it would have been better if you could have like sprinkled some of those reveals throughout the story and not left them all to the end. However, what that does mean is that the end of the book ended up being pretty exciting and pretty fun. So again, I don't think that the rest of the book was boring. A little slow, but not boring. But the ending was super, super, super exciting. So just be prepared for that if you go into this book. Okay, I don't know if you can see this on camera, the way it's like, I feel like I just put plaster on my face. I can literally feel it tightening my skin, which is a really weird feeling. But anyway, overall, what I wanted to say about this book is that I actually ended up enjoying it overall. Is it the best book I've ever read? No, it's not. But it's certainly not the worst book I ever read. I'm glad that I read it. You know, I've been struggling with a lot of these YA fantasies that I've gotten from my Alacrate book boxes. And I do think that this one is one of the better ones that I have read. So if you are looking for a, you know, a simple YA fantasy that's a bit dreamy, that has an exciting ending, I would say give Dreams Lie Beneath a chance because overall it's a pretty fun story. Okay, normally I would step away to wash my face off, but this is supposed to be a peel off mask. So let's see if, uh, let's see if that works. Oh, oh, here it goes. Ow, ow, this one really hurts. Okay, ow, it's like pulling off a band aid. I did not expect it to hurt that much. Okay, maybe I won't do this on camera. <laughs> Now it's stuck in my hair. Okay, clearly this is a disaster. So hold on a minute and I'll be right back. Ow, 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 ow. It's stuck in my hair. Okay. <laughs> this is what my face just looks like now. This is just what it looks like. Okay, note to self, make sure you don't get this mask in your hair because it really hurt pulling off and, oh, I missed a spot. I'm sure I missed a, a ton of spots and the spot didn't even dry. So, uh, yeah, that one's not coming off so well. <laughs> okay, so that was a very, very bubbly, itchy mask and don't get it in your hair and it hurts pulling off, but... I will say that my skin feels super, super, super soft, like soft as a baby's bottom. So <laughs> that's good. I guess the pain was worth it. <laughs> anyway, that's my review of The Dream Thieves and Dreams Lie Beneath. As always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not already, please subscribe to my channel for more bookish stuff coming your way soon. All right, everyone. Happy reading.